everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Goodman, and I teach in the program in Asian and Comparative Studies. Please, come in. Please, yeah, we have chairs, please. And um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Matt Siegel for having the initiatory impulse to uh, contact uh, Evan Thompson, and, um, and uh, he agreed. Uh, in his, in his uh, very busy schedule to come visit us. And so this lecture is being co-sponsored by Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness in the Asian Comparative Studies program. And um, I thought of a long introduction, but that would be perhaps boring because we have the live instantiation here. Um, currently, uh, Professor Thompson is a professor of philosophy at University of British Columbia in Canada. I first became aware of him when he co-authored or triple authored uh, The Embodied Mind, 1991. And I hear that there's going to be some new... We're writing new introductions. New introductions, right. Um, also, also the author of Mind and Life, 2007, and forthcoming October... Mm -hmm. um, the um, I'm sorry, Waking, Dreaming, and Being, New Light on the Self and Consciousness from Neuroscience, Meditation, and Philosophy. It's going to be a very large book. <laughs> and uh, I've had the great honor and privilege of sitting in his graduate uh, seminar on many of the same topics where I think cutting edge um, uh, inquiry into certain trends in Western philosophy certain trends in Buddhist textual tradition, certain trends in Buddhist meditation, and in cognitive science. I may have left something out. And at least from my perspective, being kind of a Buddhist studies person with an interest in philosophy, it's been exhilarating. And Evan's been very gracious in allowing all manner of interruption and uh, fielding really interesting questions. We have about I don't know, 15 people core, something like yeah, that. Yeah, Yeah. And um, some of you may or may not know a sort of point of affiliation. <coughs> Evan's uh, father, uh, Will Earl Thompson, was a, a presence of luminary here at CIIS. And the last time you were here, I'm trying to remember when you were here. I was here in 2010, I think it was. Okay, yeah. right. And so, uh, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Professor Thompson. Thanks very much. Um, it's lots of fun to be here. I've been in Berkeley for the semester and um, only made it over to San Francisco a couple times, so it's nice to journey over here. Um, so what I want to talk to you about tonight are some ideas from the book that was mentioned called Waking Dreaming Being. And what I'm going to be focusing on especially is consciousness and the sense of self. And in order to do that, I'm going to be talking about awareness, the contents of awareness, and then ways of identifying with certain contents of awareness as the self, or as I, or me, or mine. And here, I'm actually, though I'm, I'm not going to talk about this notion that much, I'm actually drawing on the Indian philosophical notion of ahamkara, which is usually translated as I-making, or I-maker, and the thought here is that the self is a constant, what we call the self or what we feel as the self, and I'm going to be more precise about that, is under a constant process of making. And I'm very much inspired by this um, Indian concept that figures especially in, figures in yoga, it figures in Advaita Vedanta, and it figures in Buddhism as well. And I'm going to say some things about a particular Buddhist approach to understanding the relationship between self and consciousness towards the end of the talk. There I'll be drawing on some ideas from Yogacara Buddhism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a number of different states of consciousness looking at the interplay of these three things, of awareness, contents of awareness, and ways of identifying with, with certain contents as I or me or mine. And those states are going to be the waking state, dreaming, different aspects of the dreaming state, the, the hypnagogic state, the dreaming state, lucid dreaming, and then I'm going to come back at the end to the question of what exactly is the self? Is there a self? 
and in what sense is the self under constant construction? That is, um, how can we um, make a bit more precise this notion of, of I-making? Okay, so we're going to start with the waking state. And in the waking state, we have an alternation, speaking just very generally, between relating to the outer world through the senses, relating to the outer world perceptually, and experiencing the physical body as the self. So the physical body is, if you like, the source point of the field of perception, and typically attention flits from one thing to another in the multimodal perceptual field. So that's one aspect of the waking state. But then another aspect of the waking state is that there's an ongoing stream of thoughts what William James called the stream of consciousness that includes perception but also includes inner thoughts and feelings. And we relate to those and experience certain of those as the self, especially what some philosophers and psychologists call the narrative self. That is the sense of self that involves a storyline through time. Memories of things you've done in the past, plans that you have for the future, so in, in thinking about the past and about the future, you, you typically do so in a self-oriented way, and you have an autobiographical or narrative sense of self. So two different aspects of um, awareness and sense of self in the waking state, the outer perceptual awareness and that awareness grounded on the body and a, and a sense of the body in the present moment as I, but then also the inward stream of thought in which memories and hopes and plans are taken to be um, oneself. So I want to start by looking at waking perception, say, looking at some aspects of waking perception. I'm going to focus on vision, but of course vision is not the only perceptual system. And one of the things to be said about waking perception is that whatever you see is subject to interpretation or meaning. And a particularly interesting case of that is where we have what psychologists call ambiguous figures that, or bistable figures. That is, figures that can shift in the perceptual meaning that they're seen to have. So if you look at this for a while, so this is a painting from Dolly that some of you may know, the slave market with disappearing bust of Voltaire. So this is the bust of Voltaire under one viewing, but then you can also shift and see these as faces belonging to the figures here. So you can shift back and forth between these two views. So this is like simpler examples like the figure that, like for example, the so-called Necker cube, the two-dimensional line drawing that flips in 3D orientations. That's an ambiguous figure. And this is, of course, a much more complicated ambiguous figure that doesn't just involve geometric changes, but involves changes in perceptual meaning. So what I want to do is use this idea of alternations in perception as a way of entering into consciousness in the waking state. And the way that I'm going to do that is by talking about a certain kind of experimental situation that I imagine many of you are familiar with called binocular rivalry. Binocular rivalry is a very controlled way of creating, in an experimental context, alternations in perception, where there's nothing changing outside in the stimuli, but your perception will shift back and forth between two views. So what's happening here is that there's a stimulus that's, gonna, that's being presented. Actually, it's a figure four and a letter H, one to each eye. So the four goes to one eye and the H goes to the other eye. And what happens usually is that you see a patchwork of the two. And then eventually your perception will shift to one and it will be dominant for a while. And then it will shift to the other and it will be dominant for a while. So the, the percept is going to alternate between the four and the H. In this, in this particular case. Now you can actually do this for yourself if you want. If you have a sheet of paper, you can just roll it up and um, look through one eye and, and place your um, hand at the right distance. And you'll see an alternation, in this case, between a hole in your hand and then the hand, a hole in your hand where you see the orange pumpkin behind, 
and then the hole fills in and you'll see your whole hand. And your perception will shift in an unpredictable way between these two images or between these two percepts because you have two different images being presented, one to each eye, and there's, they are undergoing a rivalry in, for dominance in the visual system. Now, why is this interesting? One reason it's interesting is that this perceptual situation has been used to experimentally investigate what's going on in the brain when there are these perceptual shifts. The idea here being that nothing outside, nothing out in the world is changing, but your perception is changing. So if we knew ex which brain patterns were correlating with what you are consciously perceiving, then that would be a, a neural marker or a neural correlate of what's in your visual awareness. So it's a way of exploring the neural correlates of consciousness. So I want to mention one example of an experiment that did this. And this was an experiment that um, was published some years ago that came from the lab of Francisco Varela, um, actually published after he died, but the work was, um, was carried out by his um, graduate student, Diego Cosmelli, under his supervision. And what they did is they used as their alternating, or as their rival stimuli, the image of a face, and then the image of an expanding checkerboard ring. So you see that over, through time, the checkerboard ring expands, expands, and that means that it's a stimulus that has a certain frequency. When you have a certain frequency in the stimulus, then with certain neuroimaging tools, you can track brain activity that's at that frequency. So it's a way of using a, a, a stimulus as a so-called frequency tag. So what they found is that, so if you look at the top row, the, the, the colored areas are um, areas of, um, of um, re regions of, of um, enhanced brain activity, and the black lines are synchrony between them. So that there's a, the, the idea is that the neurons start to fire in synchrony in this free, for this frequency tag stimulus. So you have a certain kind of coherent pattern in time that is the that is the, um, the synchronous relationship among these areas. And, and the idea here is that basically, as the stimulus comes into your awareness, there's a buildup in the brain of a synchronous pattern of activity. And then as it is suppressed, that synchrony pattern falls apart. So the perceptual stimulus is dominant at the top, where you have those, um, the, the, the most of the black lines, and then it starts to fall apart. And that corresponds to here the subject presses a button and reports that now the stimulus is fully there. And then it subsides, and then there's a build up again. So what, what's interesting about this is that it's not as if there's a particular area in the brain that is the special visual consciousness area. It's rather that there are, there's, there are patterns of activity in a number of different places having to do with attention, having to do with working memory, having to do with, um, with visual discriminations at different levels of the visual system, and they're coming into a synchrony pattern when the content is in your awareness, and then they're falling apart, and then they're building up again. So there's a kind of pulsing in your, in your stream of visual awareness as the stimuli shifts between the face and the expanding checkerboard ring. Now, you might ask, well, is this completely out of control, or is there some way that attention and volitional control can modulate this? <clears throat> and it's been known that attention affects it, but in a study that's a quite interesting one using Tibetan Buddhist monks, what they asked the monks to do is they, they gave them the, the rivalrous display in, the, in, in, a, in goggles that they were, that they were um, wearing. And they asked the monks to practice a concentration meditation, so a single pointed attention on the visual display, that's the object of concentration. And then the control was a compassion meditation, where they're, where they're generating the affect of compassion, but without focused attention on the visual display. 
and then I believe a, a, a neutral state. So what they found is that in the concentration meditation, there were extreme increases in the dominance of the stimulus during the meditation and then persisting after the meditation. And there was also a, a novel kind of perception where sometimes they would report seeing one stimulus as dominant and the other one behind it. So what's interesting about this is that it shows that this is subject to modulations by attention. And in this case, with individuals who have highly trained their attention to, to, to keep it stable on a particular object of focus, that this quite dramatically changes the binocular rivalry experience. And as the, as the study said, these results contrast sharply with the reported observations of over 1,000 meditation-naive individuals tested previously. So meditation-naive individuals generally means undergraduate college students who, <laughs> take, <laughs> who have to do the experiment as part of a credit for their course. So that's a kind of thin range of human experience. And in the case of individuals who train their concentrative abilities, it, 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 makes, um, it makes a significant difference. So this is an example of attention and perception in the waking state. Now remember I also said that the waking state, there's a stream of consciousness with thoughts in which one identifies with certain thoughts in an autobiographical way. So I want to look at an example of that now. And to illustrate that, I'm going to mention a study, talk about a study, that was um, done by some colleagues of mine when I was at the University of Toronto. And what they did is they looked at individuals who had undergone an eight-week mindfulness training course in the form of mindfulness-based stress reduction. And they compared individuals who had undergone this training to individuals who hadn't for certain kinds of self-experience. So specifically, they asked the individuals to either adopt an experiential self-focus, which meant simply being aware in the present moment, noticing whatever arises, um, not particularly engaging in any train of thought, but keeping a kind of present centered body awareness, versus a narrative self-focus where you are reading, so in either case you're reading adjectives that are personality trait words that are positive or negative, so they're coming up on the screen. So in the experiential self-focus, you're simply taking notice of the word, of its meaning, but not engaging in any particular train of thought. If you find yourself engaging in a train of thought and notice that, return your awareness simply to being there in that sort of present-centered bodily way. And that's, of course, something that mindfulness training works with as a, as a basic practice. In the narrative self-focus, the instruction was to read the word, think about its meaning, and think about how it relates to you. So, nervous, am I nervous? Well, I remember, you know, there was an occasion on which I was really nervous. Um, hopeful, um, well, I'm usually not that hopeful a person. Um, you know, life is, life is tough. You can imagine the sort of ramifications and elaborations that you can get drawn into that are self-related, because they have to do about the word meaning in relationship to yourself. Okay, so they compared then for these two different kinds of self-focus, the mindfulness-trained individuals versus the individuals who hadn't undergone this kind of training. So what they found is, first, generally, the narrative focus engages particular areas of the brain that are, that are along the midline of the cortex. So these structures, this is, not a, this is not a particularly surprising finding, these structures are known to be involved in evaluating things in relationship to yourself. So you see for the narrative focus, activity in these areas. In the case of the experiential focus, for the novices, that is the people who hadn't, hadn't undergone the mindfulness training, you do see a reduction in activity in these regions. But in the individuals who have been trained in the mindfulness form of meditation, you see significant reduction in these areas, and you also see the mobilization of a different 
network of brain areas that have to do with interoceptive awareness and um, the sense of the body in the present moment. So what we see in this experiment is that there are two different kinds of self-awareness, let's call them. One is a kind of narrative self-identification where you're thinking things like, I am, yeah, I'm nervous, or, you know, yeah, I'm hopeful, so this, I am such and such, first person pronoun, attributing some quality to yourself, and then elaborating that perhaps in memory or in some future um, imagining of the situation, versus bodily awareness, awareness of the body in the present moment, and you see different networks coming into play for these two different modes of awareness. And the individuals who have the mindfulness training are more flexible in being able to shift from one to the other. So the thought here is that mindfulness facilitates not getting stuck on that narrative sense of self. Not getting sort of pulled into it, but being able to flexibly return your awareness to the body in the present moment. Okay, still in our little tour of the waking state, you could say, I want to look at another study that examined mind wandering. So mind wandering is precisely what happens when you are doing something and then you find yourself drifting into a train of thought that typically involves this narrative sense of self. You think about maybe things that happened earlier in the day or concerns that are preoccupying you, that draw on memory, or you plan what you're going to do the next week. So mind wandering involves this kind of narrative sense of self. Versus focused attention, say for example on the breath, in a context of meditation, where you put your attention on the breath, and you follow it, and then of course inevitably your mind wanders, you notice that your mind has wandered, you return your attention to the breath, so there's a kind of cycle that happens. And so this, in this experiment, they were interested in looking at what's going on in the brain precisely through this kind of cycle where you have a focus on the breath that you're attempting to sustain, but inevitably your mind wanders, distracting thoughts arise. At a certain point, you become aware of your mind as having wandered, and then you shift your attention back to the focus. And what they found is that there are distinct networks associated with all of these. So the mind wandering involves regions belonging to the so-called default network, which is described as a kind of um, set of regions that are seen to be active in experimental contexts in neuroimaging where you're not engaged in a sort of outer attention demanding task, but you're just, as it were, at rest. So these areas are active, and the thought is that one of the things that might likely be happening is that your mind is wandering. The awareness of the mind wandering is associated with a network that's called the salience network that has to do with things that have a kind of felt um, meaning or salience. So if you think of yourself noticing your mind wandering while you're in a situation where you're trying to follow your breath, it's like, oh, my mind's wandering. All of a sudden, that's salient and your awareness is key to it. And on the basis of that, you can then shift your attention and then try to sustain it again. And that, of course, involves what are the, the so-called executive attention networks. So to summarize, in the waking state, what we see is fluctuations in perception that involve interpreting the meaning of things that are showing up perceptually with attention moving from one thing to another, with the body as the, the source of the perceptual um, field, and then a dynamics of ongoing inner thoughts in which you identify with the contents of the memories, the plans, and so on. So a, a perceptually, um, a bodily-based outer-oriented self in perception, and then a, a cognitive narrative self that's caught up, for example, in mind-wandering. Okay, so now we're going to look at dreaming. And I'm going to talk about three things under the heading of dreaming. I'm going to talk about the hypnagogic state, which is the state of, literally the word hypnagogic means leading into sleep. I'm going to talk about dreaming, and I'm going to talk about lucid dreaming. So the hypnagogic state is the state where, as you're starting to drift into sleep, or the so-called sleep onset, you experience 
colors and shapes, um, maybe sounds, maybe the sense of people talking in the room, but it's not quite outside, it's not quite inside. In our culture, many people say, oh, I never experienced anything like that, I just fall asleep. And that's because in our culture, we run around and we're stressed and we lead really hectic lives, and so we just kind of crash, as we say. So if you try to go to sleep in a calmer, more mindful way, let's say, eventually that experience changes from just kind of dropping into sleep to being much more aware of this liminal zone between waking and sleeping, which throughout history has been associated with a lot of creative insights. Scientists and artists and poets have used the hypnagogic state as a, as a, source, of, um, as a source of creative insights. Now, one of my favorite descriptions of it is from Proust. So this is a passage that um, occurs early on that is spoken by the narrator of the first volume of, of Remembrance of Things Past. So he says, for a long time I went to bed early. Sometimes my candle scarcely out, my eyes would close so quickly that I did not have time to say to myself, I'm going to sleep. And half an hour later, the thought that it was time to try to sleep would wake me. I wanted to put down the book I thought I still had in my hands and blow out my light. I had not ceased while sleeping to form reflections on what I had just read, but these reflections had taken a rather peculiar turn. It seemed to me that I myself was what the book was talking about. A church, a quartet, the rivalry between Francois I and Charles Saint. So, What's interesting about this is that there is this inner train of thought that I was talking about, the mind wandering, that's present as the narrator is entering into sleep. At the same time, the structure of waking consciousness, which involves, you could say, a reasonably sharp differentiation between the self in here and what's going on out there, which actually is present even in the mind wandering, because you're, you're, you're sort of running a simulation, as it were, of yourself in the past and yourself in the future. So that sharp self-world distinction is present. Here in the hypnagogic state, that falls apart. So that, as Proust says, it seemed to me that I myself was what the book was talking about. So there's, there's a, um, in, in, in psychoanalytic language, we could say that there's a dissolution of ego boundaries. That is, that the self-world structure is, is no longer there. That you identify in an absorbed and immersed way with whatever the thoughts or the images are. So it's interesting because it marks a contrast. It's a change in the structure of our experience of the self that contrasts with the waking state. So there's a dissolution of the boundaries between self and not self. And interestingly, there's no strong sense of being immersed in a world. That is, in the waking state, you feel like you're immersed in a world that you can move about, that you can, you can look at, and that structure is there as well in memory and in future planning. But here, there's a kind of spectator consciousness. Sartre calls this, Sartre has a fantastic discussion of hypnagogia in his um, work, The Imaginary, and he calls it a spellbound consciousness. He says that consciousness is fascinated by the image and it identifies with the image. And he says the image, his, 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 his word is the image is consciousness. It's not consciousness of an image, the image is consciousness. And that it's spontaneous, that there's this kind of creative spontaneity of image production or of image consciousness. And one of the things that's interesting to play with, I remember playing with this when I was a little kid, is that the images, you can't fixate your gaze on them. If you put your gaze on them, the image falls apart. So you have to kind of keep, if you want to, if you're sort of semi-conscious lucid and you want to follow it, you kind of have to keep the image almost off to the side and sort of watch it peripherally because if you tr try to look at it, it just completely shifts into something else or falls apart. And that's because the image is not something that's separate from the eye movement. As you move your eyes about in the waking state, the world out there stays stable and you can move your eyes around. You're always moving your eyes around. If you don't move your eyes around, the, the world actually dissolves visually. So here though, if you move your, as you move your eyes, the images are constantly changing because the images are, are as it were, attached 
to the eye movement. And finally, all of this is highly suggestible. So if you're also still lucid and have a degree of waking awareness, you can simply through thought kind of modulate the image in, you know, from one thing into another in a very suggestible and, and intentional way. Okay, so that's the hypnagogic state. So the dream state now. One of the things that's interesting about the dream state is that, of course, there's a great variety of dreams, but dreams recover that self-world structure. And in many mythologies and in many um, early writings about dreams, dreams are often presented as another world. So you journey to the land of dreams. In the earliest of the Upanishads, where we have the differentiation of the waking state, the dreaming state, and the state of dreamless sleep, dreams are described as a place where the self travels. And then eventually, we see a kind of shift in the description of, the, of dreaming into not so much a place, but a state of consciousness. <coughs> so the idea that it's a place that you would travel to is very much connected to the idea that there is this self-world structure that reconstitutes itself or reappears in the dream state. I particularly like this expression of that. This is, a, this is a poem by Robert Herrick where he says, Here we are all by day, by night we're hurled, by dreams each one into a several world. And several is in the older meaning means each one into his own world or her own world, into a separate world. So the idea is that in the dream, you're immersed in a world. Whereas in the hypnagogic state, that's not the case. You are looking at visual patterns and you're absorbed in them or you're hearing sounds that are sort of inside you but sort of in the room. Whereas in the dream, you experience being in the dream or being in the dream world. So the self-world structure comes back. Now, interesting aspect of the self-world structure is that there's different ways that it can be configured in the dream. So if we take as an example one of the oldest dream narratives in Western literature, and think about it, we can bring out that structure. So I think it's in the 22nd book of the Iliad, Homer describes Achilles pursuing Hector. And he says, as in a dream, a man chasing another cannot catch him, nor can he in flight escape from his pursuer. So Achilles could not by his swiftness overtake him, nor could Hector pull away. So it's an extremely powerful image, because often we experience being chased in our dreams. Fleeing is a, is a, is a common dream theme. And so, here, it's running from your pursuer, but never really getting away, but never really being overtaken. Now, if you think about it, you can, suppose you were having a dream like that, there's two ways in which you might experience that. So one would be from within, that is, you're running and you look over your shoulder and you see Achilles pursuing you. But another way to experience it is you see the whole scene from outside. Psychologists, when they're talking about memory, refer to this as the difference between a field perspective and an observer perspective. So in the field perspective, it's the immersed first person perspective. You're, you're seeing the scene through your own eyes. Whereas in the observer perspective, it's as if you're occupying an elevated perspective and you're looking down on the scene and seeing it from below. And we have both kinds of dreams. We have immersed dreams, first person perspective dreams, and we have observer perspective dreams. And we have the same thing in memory. So if you think about something that happened to you earlier in the day, you might spontaneously call up the memory in a first-person perspective, or you might see yourself from the outside. And we know that if we um, are in a context of, say, investigating memory experimentally, we can bias which way the memory goes. So if I ask you how you <coughs> felt this morning when you 
got up from bed. Chances are you'll experience the memory in the first person field perspective because I've biased your memory towards the emotions, towards the feelings, towards the bodily sensations. But if I ask you what you were wearing, chances are you'll see the scene from the outside because I've asked you for factual information. And that tends to facilitate or to bias the memory towards the outside perspective. And we know also that there are different brain systems that are involved in recall when you retrieve a memory from the first person perspective and when you retrieve it from the outside perspective. Okay, so another distinction I want to introduce here is between what I'm going to call the self as object and the self as subject. So this is, I think, a nice way to illustrate this distinction. So the self as object is the self that, for example, would be your face in a mirror. Or in this case of the Escher engraving, he's holding the, the, um, the glass ball that's reflecting back himself holding it. So this is an image of himself in the sense of self as object. It's a perceptual image that he recognizes as an image of himself. But the self as subject is the one undergoing that perceptual experience. You can't represent the self as subject in a picture because it's the viewer. It's the first person perspective. So the self as object is the hand here and also the image. And the self as subject is the viewer in the case of in the case of this image. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this distinction and we're going to use it to think about how self-experience happens in dreams. Okay, so here, if we say you are asleep and dreaming, then one sense of self is you asleep in the bed. So that's the self as dreamer. But now, in the immersed dream world, there is, we could call it the dream ego. So that's the dream where the self-world structure has come back. And let's suppose that it's from the first person perspective that you're living through this dream. So there's a self as subject in the dream. And there's a self as object because maybe you look down at your hands or maybe you're flying in the dream and you, know, you see maybe your legs stretched out. So there's the perceptual aspect of yourself as an object in the dream, and there's the self as subject in the dream. Notice that within the dream, you, you create a self-world, self as object, self as subject difference, though everything in the dream is a content of your awareness. It's a content of the awareness of the self as dreamer. So it highlights this identification with contents of awareness as the self, because everything is a content of awareness of the self in one sense of the self in a dream, but yet within the dream you mark some things as self and some things as not self. Okay, now, another feature of the dream state that's important to bring in to the discussion here is how the cognitive function is different in a dream. So, first of all, dreams also have very intense emotions, more intense usually than, than the waking state or ordinary waking states. But there's also ways that attention functions in a dream that's different. So if I were to ask you right now to just look at the candle flame and fix your gaze on it from wherever you are in the room, and then direct your mental attention to something off in the periphery of your visual field, and just hold it there, you can do that. And you might have a sense that there's some kind of feeling of competition that it sort of seems like, okay, your mental attention is going over there, but then the, you, you also are trying to keep your visual gaze fixed, so maybe you have a sense that there's some kind of, um, that it's a demanding task, or there's some kind of um, competition that might be happening, or maybe you find it um, not particularly difficult. It's an example of cognitive control, a cognitive control of attention that is typically not present in the dream state. In the dream state, your attention is captured very much by whatever is happening in the dream. And you don't usually think to shift your attention in a dream. Your just attention shifts from one thing to the next. And if you think about it, 
in the dream, in, per, in waking perception, you have the sense that you're paying attention to something and there's other things in the periphery that you could shift your attention to. But the dream is more like imagination. Whatever it is that you're seeing in the dream is where your attention is focused. If, you, if I ask you right now to visualize in your mind's eye a full moon, you can do that, but if you shift your attention, then the moon is gone. It's not as if you can keep the image of the moon there when you shift your attention to something else. You might, you might say to yourself, okay, I'm going to imagine a moon on the horizon, now I see the moon, and now I'm going to look at the horizon, but the, when you look at the horizon in imagination, you're no longer looking at the moon. You cognitively can say to yourself, well, I'm imagining the moon still. That is, you can cognitively frame it that way. But in terms of the imagery, it's highly attention-dependent in imagination. So dreams, I think, are like that. They're highly attention-dependent. And that makes them, although we often talk about dream perception, dreams are, in a way, actually more imagination, more, they resemble more closely imagination, I think, than perception. Now, in terms of the neuroscience, um, there's lots of things to say, but one thing I just want to highlight is that in rapid eye movement sleep, which is associated most closely with um, strong visual dreaming, that areas of the brain <coughs> that are known to be crucial for controlling attention volitionally and for planning, so this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, number four there, circled in red, we know that those are inhibited in rapid eye movement sleep. And that's going to be important now when we contrast dreaming with lucid dreaming. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about. Okay, so lucid dreaming. What I mean by a lucid dream is a dream in which you can direct your attention to the dreamlike quality of the state. I don't mean that you can control the imagery. You might or might not be able to control the imagery to any varying degree. But what marks it as a lucid dream is that you know it's a dream and you can pay attention to it as a dream. In an ordinary dream, you can't do that. You, you just don't even mark the fact that it's a dream. You, you, in some sense, take yourself to be awake. So in a lucid dream, you can pay attention to the dreamlike quality of the state which means you now have, remember I distinguished awareness, contents of awareness, and ways of identifying with contents of awareness? That means that you now are aware of the contents of awareness as contents of awareness. You have a kind of meta-awareness of the contents of your consciousness. And that's what makes lucid dreaming so, um, one of the things that makes it so, um, so powerful when it happens is all of a sudden, boom, you have a whole awareness of the state that's no longer just an awareness of the, of the contents of the state in the, in the spellbound sense of attention. And that typically brings with it greater clarity and vividness, often a hyper-realism, often an emotional exhilaration with the realization that one's dreaming, and a sense of freedom. Now, if we think about this in relationship to the self or self-experience, if it's a very strong lucid dream, because there, there are degrees in experience of lucidity, but if it's a very strong lucid dream, then no matter what the contents of the dream are, including whatever dream ego form you have, however you're embodied in the dream, or maybe you're not even embodied, maybe you're just a kind of visual perspective, you know that they're not the same as the awareness of the dream state. That is to say, you no longer fully identify with the dream ego as the self. So now, if we go back to our senses of self, and we think about it in relationship to lucid dreaming, suppose that you have a, a very, very powerful lucid dream, and you know you're asleep in bed. You might even remember other lucid dreams you've had. You might even remember, oh, um, I... Um, I've dreamed lucidly before, and now I'm dreaming lucidly again, and oh, this seems to happen more frequently. If it's a very powerful lucid dream, those kinds of waking thoughts can often come to you. So suppose you think the thought, I am dreaming. Well, the first person pronoun I there picks out the self as dreamer, the one who's asleep in the bed. And the quality of that self, let's say phenomenologically, is the witnessing of the dream state the meta-awareness of the dream state. 
But if you say, suppose it's a flying dream, because flying is often a dream sign that can bring about lucid dreaming for, for people. Suppose you say, I am flying. Well, the I there doesn't refer to the self as dreamer, the self lying in bed, that self's not flying. It refers to the dream ego. The dream ego, the self as subject. And then you might also see your hand stretched out before you, and that would be the dream ego, self as object. So you get a, 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 a complexification in the structure of self-experience in the case of the lucid dream state. All right, so in terms of um, the neuroscience side of things, there's now begun to be a few studies that are neuroimaging studies of lucid dreaming. So this is one that looks at the activity recorded at the scalp with EEG. So this is where you have electrodes on the scalp measuring um, electrical activity that reflects underlying activity in the cortex. And the way that this works is that, many of you I, I imagine would know this, is that in um, rapid eye movement sleep, your eyes are moving about, and if you, in the dream, move your dream ego eyes left, right, left, right, the physical eyes move left, right, left, right in a regular way, and this can be picked up on the eye trace and used to mark an epoch or a period of lucid dreaming. So when this is done, you can contrast the lucid dream period with the non-lucid dream period in rapid eye movement sleep. And what's interesting about this is that you see, so this is, um, these traces are individual subjects, and so there's a pronounced rhythm um, in, the, uh, in the alpha uh, frequency, but also in faster frequencies, gamma and beta, that are associated with um, cognitive function, things like um, working memory and attentional selection. And these drop off in non-lucid REM sleep, but they're comparable in the lucid dreaming state to the waking state. So you see, in other words, neural correlates of consciousness that occur in the sleep state that resemble the waking state. So that the distinction between, now we have to distinguish in a way two meanings of awake because there's the waking state in the sense of not being asleep. But then there's the waking state in the sense of actually being aware of your state. So waking up in the dream, the quality of wakefulness in the dream that is the, the marker of the lucid dream state. Another um, interesting study, so this is by Martin Dressler in um, Munich, I think. So here you see the, um, the eye movement traces that, that left, right, left, right, that mark the, um, the onset and offset of the um, lucid dream period, or when the subject is lucid dreaming and then when the subject wakes up. So what we see, so this is an fMRI study, is the, the basic story is that you see activity in this area, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that I mentioned before, that's um, inhibited in REM sleep. It reactivates, as it were, in lucid dreaming, and you also see activity in a cluster of regions that make up what's called the frontoparietal um, control network, so or control system. So this is a whole host of reasons that have to do with attention and holding things in memory and organizing cognition, you could say. And these regions are crucial for state awareness of the dream in the lucid dream. And interestingly, these are the regions that in terms of biological evolution are most marked in their expansion and complexification as you go from, say, the macaque monkey to the human being. So you can think of this as a kind of um, increase in meta-awareness that occurs with human life that makes it another kind of being awake possible the kind of being awake that occurs in the lucid dream, and the kind of being awake that, for example, meditative or contemplative traditions would cultivate under the heading of the word um, mindfulness. And of course, there, there are different ways that those practices um, can work. Okay, so let's put a bunch of things together now. So I've been talking about the sense of self and how we identify with certain contents as self. This happens in mind wandering and in memory, what psychologists call mental time travel. You remember the past, 
or you project yourself into the future, which is sometimes called remembering the future because it draws on the same cognitive functions, the same brain systems. In dreaming and lucid dreaming, we have the same um, structure of experiencing from within or seeing yourself from outside that also occurs in memory. If you freely imagine something, you can imagine it from within or you can imagine yourself in the scene as seen from without. And then in out-of-body experiences, what's interesting about those in relation to these other experiences is that they are experiences in which you see yourself from the outside. So they're different from mental time travel and lucid dreaming and imagination, but they have similar, um, they partake of, of some of the same features of being able to have an outside perspective on yourself, though now it's an outside perceptual, it feels perceptual in the out-of-body experience. It's not, it doesn't feel like memory. It seems like there I am lying in the bed below. And so you see yourself from the outside, so the self as object is the self lying in bed, and the self as subject is, say, the visual perspective from which you're viewing it up by the ceiling. Now, developmentally, we know that these things emerge around the same time. Memory, imagination, and narrative self-dreaming, at least according to one researcher, David Fulkes, who's written this book on children's dreaming and the development of consciousness, argues that these emerge all around age five. And I want to say something coming from developmental psychology to bring out what's involved in this construction of a sense of self where you can see yourself from the outside. So in order to do that, I need to introduce the notion of what psychologists call joint attention. So this is an example of joint attention where all three are looking at the same thing and they all know that the other is looking at the same thing. So their attention is shared in the sense that it's focused on one thing and they know that their attention is focused on one thing. So this is what psychologists call joint attention. Now, in development, what happens is that the baby will come to understand that, say, a toy is the object of the mother or the caregiver's attention and that they are sharing attention to the toy. So the infant can recognize that the mother through, say, eye gaze and following eye gaze is attending to the toy, and the infant also can know that they're both attending to the toy. Eventually, the infant, or the baby, or the, or the toddler, depending on exactly where we mark this um, emergence, comes to understand that it's the object of the caregiver's attention and knows that it's the object of the caregiver's attention. So it knows that it's being viewed from the outside by the other and that they are sharing attention to the self. And this is an important milestone in development. So for example, um, Michael Tomasello writes the following. He says, joint attention is sometimes characterized as the child coordinating attention between just two things, the object and the adult. But as the child begins to monitor adults' attention to outside entities, that outside entity sometimes turns out to be the child herself. And so she begins to monitor adults' attention to her and thus to see herself from the outside. She also comprehends the role of the adult from the same outside vantage point. And so overall, it is as if she were viewing the whole scene from above with herself as just one player in it. So that's exactly the structure that we see occurring in imagination, in memory, in dreams, in out-of-body experiences. And the point here is that it takes a certain cognitive development of attention and sense of self that's fundamentally social and intersubjective in order to get this aspect of the sense of self. That isn't just the feeling of the body here and now, but is the sense of self that can be seen by another, that can be seen from the outside, and that has some kind of continuity through time. We can also relate this to language, where, if you're like me anyway, you hear this voice inside your head all the time, and it appears to be talking all the time, and who exactly is it talking to anyway? Well, that's internalized external speech. So we, we learn language, and we internalize the speech we hear, we, we create an inner 
monologue, dialogue that makes up the narrative self or that helps to constitute the narrative self. So the narrative self is social and it's linguistic in construction. Okay, so now we're coming into the last part of the talk. So the question then is, well, if the self is a construction, what exactly is it? Is there a self? Is it an illusion? How should we think about it? And in order to address that question, I want to bring in some Buddhist philosophy. And I want to, in particular, bring in philosophy from the Yogacara tradition. Because the Yogacara tradition presents a certain model of consciousness. It doesn't diagram it this way. This is my way of diagramming it. Where we have what's called a store, or repository, or base consciousness, which is subliminal, which you're not aware of, typically, and that contains, is the, is the basis for habits and dispositions and tendencies, and in the traditional Buddhist image, is planted with seeds that eventually ripen or bear fruit. So that's a metaphor for things manifesting in actions that are that are manifesting out of the dispositional tendencies of what's accumulated over the course of a life, or in the Buddhist context, of course, traditional Buddhist context, over the course of many lives. So this is a kind of fundamental repository of, you could say, first-person information, or of information that participates in a sense of the first person. Then we have a mode of consciousness, or a form of consciousness, that is called manas, and that is a kind of self-awareness. It's this, again, this sense of I am, the ahamkara, the sense of, the sense of being alive, the sense of, of, the sense of being, the sense of being aware, and it's pre-attentive. It isn't a function of where your attention happens to be located. It's more basic than that. And it is a base for the shifting and fluctuating and changing attentional states of mental awareness, where you're aware of a thought or aware of a memory. Those are attention dependent, but they have this feeling of being yours because there's this feeling I am, and there's this repository of information that is conditioning that. Now in the Yogacara context, strictly speaking, this pre-attentive mind or manas is neutral. but. In the unenlightened state, it's afflicted because it misidentifies the store consciousness and the changing mental states as grounded in a real self. It mistakes the store consciousness for a self. So the idea is that in each moment there's an arising of consciousness that has kind of dual aspect structure, a, a perceiver side and a perceived side, or an apprehending side and an apprehended. And that's reified into a real object and a real subject, where the real subject is taken to be a true, unchanging, abiding, controlling self. And that's afflicted. It's, it's distorted. It's dysfunctional. So if we were to translate this into a kind of cognitive science way of talking, we would say that there's this pre-attentive mode of being self-aware, which doesn't mean aware of a self, it just means this being aware, this feeling of being alive, of, of I am in that minimal sense. And it draws on latent mental tendencies, dispositions, etc., and transforms into first-person self-descriptions, like I am happy, I see the rose, I like the taste of mango. So these are explicit first-person thoughts. And it does this through the mental consciousness, but now from the cognitive science perspective, we can also say that it does it through social cognition and language. So this is, I think, entirely compatible with the Buddhist view, but it would be very much brought out by the cognitive science perspective. So by social cognition and language, I mean the things I was talking about before, joint attention, shared intentions, um, the internalization of external speech, and so on. Okay, now, within Buddhism, there are there's many takes on this, actually, but there's two main takes on this that I want to contrast. So one, you see in Vasubandhu. So he's working within the Yogacara framework, 
And his view is that these first-person self-descriptions, I am such and such, that the way that they function is referentially. So the pronoun I purports to refer to a self. That's the, that's the grammar here. Is it's, it's, it, 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 it has a kind of referential function. But really there is no self. There's just an impersonal, momentary stream of consciousness with the mental tendencies and so on. So I, the pronoun I, fails to refer. So on that view, strictly speaking, although we can talk about everyday discourses having a pragmatic function, strictly speaking, the I discourse is always in air. It's always mistaken, because there really is nothing for the I to refer to. We see a different view in Chandrakirti, who's speaking from a Madhyamaka perspective. And he says, no. It's not right to think that first-person self-description functions referentially. In other words, that the pronoun I is not an ordinary referring term. It functions, we could say, performatively. That is, the pronoun I individuates whoever it is who's using it, and it appropriates things to it, but it doesn't function referentially, so there's no error simply in using the first person pronoun per se. The error is to believe that the self has an independent existence. That is a mistake, because there is no self that has, there is no single abiding controlling self that has an independent existence. But we don't impugn ordinary use of the first person pronoun in the way that Vasubandhu does by saying that it fails to refer. Now, why am I contrasting these views? Because we see a similar contrast in cognitive science today. So we have two views. One I'll call neuro-reductionism, and one I'll call the inactive view. So the inactive view is my view. And the neuro-reductionist view is a view of a good friend of mine who actually just gave a lecture in Berkeley the other night. Uh -huh. So neuro-reductionism, this is Thomas Metzinger's view. So neuro-reductionism <laughs> says there is no self. All there really is is the illusion of a self created by the brain. In, in Metzinger's language, there's, the brain has a self-model, but there is no self that it models. So I fails to refer. Expressions in which it occurs, strictly speaking, are false. Of course, we use it pragmatically, but strictly speaking, it doesn't refer to what it seems to refer to. Whereas what I want to say is the self is a process, not an entity, it's enacted through social cognition and language. It's rooted in the life of the body, which includes, of course, the brain, but isn't limited to the brain. And it's immersed in the environment. I, the word I, or the pronoun I, functions performatively, not referentially. So there is no error that's being made. So to bring out the contrast, let me read you something from Thomas Metzinger's book. He says, this is on the, on the um, first page, actually. Yeah. No such things as selves exist in the world. Nobody ever was or had a self. All that ever existed were conscious self-models that could not be recognized as models. The subjective experience of being someone emerges if a conscious information processing system operates under a transparent self-model. That means you, just see, you don't see the model, you just see right through it. You are such a system right now. Because you cannot recognize your self-model as a model, you constantly confuse yourself with the content of the self-model currently activated by your brain. So there is no self, there's just a self-model. You can't see the model, you see through it. And you identify with what the model, you identify with the content of the model. So in his view, self-identification is in a way, strictly speaking, always delusional or always, always, um, it, it's basically fundamentally an illusion. It might be a very, from an evolutionary standpoint, efficacious and useful illusion, but nonetheless, metaphysically speaking, it's an illusion. My view, this is the shameless self-advertising moment, <laughs> is to say that the self is not a thing but a process, where that means that the self is a process of I. And this is one way of thinking about this Indian notion I began with, of ahamkara. Self is a process of I, a process that enacts an I, and in which the I is no different from the I process itself. Rather like the way dancing is a process that enacts a dance, and in which the dance is no different from the dancing. 
So the self is enacted and it's constructed, but it's not an illusion. And I would submit that that's, to use Buddhist language, a middle way between an absolutist view, which says there is a real independent self, and a nihilist view that says there is no self. In Buddhist language, we could say that the self is a dependently originated process with a conventional identity. So it's a way of recovering, in Buddhist language, the importance of the everyday self, the conventional self, which cognitive science is always in the danger of denying because it's much more prone to the nihilist tendency than to the absolutist tendency. So I'm going to end now with um, a translation of some verses from Nagarjuna, his <coughs> bachelor, that I quite like, that expresses, I think, very well what I've been trying to present to you. So this is the chapter from the chapter of the Madhyamaka Karikas on the aggregates, the self and the aggregates. So in Bachelor's rendition, you are not the same as or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither severed from nor forever fused with them. This is the deathless teaching of Buddhas who care for the world. And then my favorite part. When Buddhas don't appear and their followers are gone, the wisdom of awakening bursts forth by itself. Thank you. Of course. Sure. So we have till midnight. <laughs> um, if, uh, Evan graciously is open to questions and tell us questions. Questions, not not speeches and <coughs> theses and manifestos. Yeah. Is your view um, identical to Pasan Gita? Well, I'm using yeah, I'm using Chandrakirti's view, which um, the Tibetans would call Pasangika. Um, it's not a term Chandrakirti himself uses. It's a later kind of Tibetan categorization, um, and. Strictly speaking, actually, um, it, it might be more of a Tibetan interpretation of Chandrakirti. Um, so the short answer would be that it is Prasangika if you think that what I present Chandrakirti as saying is actually maybe closer to how Dzongkhapa reads Chandrakirti. That's a sort of question of interpretation. But let's just simplify it by saying yes, And would Metzinger's view be correlated to any of the Buddhist views? It's close. I, I think his view is close to Vasubandhu's, actually. Yeah. I think, I think um, he's, he thinks there are states of consciousness. Um, he thinks they supervene on the brain. So there's a difference with Vasubandhu there. Um, they're momentary processes. Um, and it's a mistake to think that there is any real self or that, um, that there's just the illusion of there being a self. Whereas, so Vasubandhu is a reductionist, and Metzinger is a reductionist. So they're, I would say they're, they're similar. Yeah. I mean, you could also say that Metzinger is, if, if you're in the Indian context, you could say he's also like Charvaka, because he's a materialist, and he denies that there's irreducible consciousness. But. Is there any correlate, though, in, in modern schools of, of Buddhist thinking? To there are Buddhist philosophers, um, not so much Buddhist teachers and practitioners, but Buddhist philosophers who, like Mark Sideritz, whose views are pretty close to Metzinger's. Yeah. In your presentation, you said dreaming is like imagination. Yeah. Uh, is there? Uh, any possibility of such kind of dreaming where you don't imagine what you all what you do is just listening to some sounds? Um, possibly. I, uh, I I I don't. I've never heard of dreams like that. But what I, what I mean by imagination that that would still count as <coughs> imagination in the sense that the sounds are. Um, internally generated mental mental images of sound. So images don't have to be visual. If you, like if you right now imagine a sound in, in your mind, um, that's, a, that's a kind of mental imagery 
It's auditory imagery. So in the dream, um, I have had dreams with, with very, um, very vivid and pronounced sounds, but I would still think of that as an imaginative production in the dream of sound images or of auditory imagery. So it's, it's still, uh, I mean, I had it and I was confused about this thing, whether I was dreaming or it was a sleepless night. Mm -hmm. uh, after getting up, I never felt that I had sleepless night, but the idea that because it wasn't a conventional kind of dream, mm -hmm. uh, I was forced to think what it was. Like. Yeah. Yeah. There are um, there are lots of states where you can th be unsure whether you are awake or asleep, mm -hmm. and um, whether you were dreaming or whether you were awake, and it's very hard to tell from within yeah. which state it is. But but you also mentioned in your presentation that when you are having lucid dreams. You know that you yeah. are dreaming. Oh, well, sorry. It was the other part of the presentation when you are objectifying yourself mm -hmm. in the dream. Mm -hmm. So at that point of time, you know that you are standing out of the dream and you are dreaming. So this is sort of thing which has happened to me when I listen to the songs. Mm -hmm. I just knew that it is a dream state and I'm dreaming, but these are the songs. Yeah, so that sounds like a lucid dream. That if you if you if you um, think or know that it's a dream state, mm -hmm. um, then that would be a case of lucid dreaming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Great. I can't Thanks. wait to get have, have a copy of the book mm -hmm. to, to spend time with. You. Um, not only because I find myself in fundamental agreement with what you're saying. <laughs> That's to burn a lot from it. Uh, I just, I'm wondering, so if we assume that um, <clears throat> you're right, that the self in its, in the, in the various kinds of experience or awareness and track is inactive in the senses that you uh, helped us see, <clears throat> what about the awareness or the sense of I that is saying, oh, it is an active, which is similar to the I or the self that is saying, this is a dream. Uh, is there something, is there a qualitative and emergent something new uh, that, that uh, uh, demands another order of explanation than the inactive? This is, so this is one question. It's, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, and another question is related but different that I, I hope I can ask you. It's one, one is more, lo this is more logical or right. more meta-theoretical, the other is more metaphysical. Um, right, so, I mean, you can have the thought, the self is enacted, um, and that's a kind of, um, I mean, that's a, so that's a thought about the self, so it's at a different logical level with regard to um, the self, but simply having the thought doesn't necessarily mean that you are um, aware in any fine-grained way of the process that's actually the inactive process. I mean, I don't think it would be, so there's a bit of a diff well, no, in some ways it's similar to a lucid dream. So you can be, in a lucid dream, you can know you're dreaming, you can attend to the dream as a dream, you may be able to control even some of the imagery to shape the dream, but you don't really have insight into the underlying dream generation process. You can't kind of see down to that level. <clears throat> so similarly, you could have um, an awareness of certain ways, for example, that you um, enact aspects of your autobiographical self, like you can catch yourself becoming caught up in a typical kind of elaborative thought, ruminative thought, where you are... Um, identifying with the content of the thought and then you can catch yourself doing that and you can simply notice the thought as a thought without attaching any kind of solidity to the content. So that's kind of an insight into 
what's going on in the enacting of the self, um, but to sort of see into everything that goes into enacting the self, I, I don't think that would be possible because um, so much of what's happening is dependent on the body and the brain and things that you can't, you know, you can't sort of penetrate <coughs> through consciousness. There's that, there's that kind of like life regulation aspect of, of enacting the mm. self. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I read the book to pursue that thought further, but if I may, the second quick one. Yep. Uh, do you consider at all so-called veridical apparitions, let's say from psychical research, uh, yeah. where, where somebody will appear not mediated through the regular senses, right. um, deathbed visions and so on, which right. would be similar than the Tibet traditions where people might meet dead, you know, dead gurus and so on. Right. Um, what do you do with that? Yeah. So there are two chapters in the book um, where those kinds of things come up. One on out-of-body experiences and one on dying and death. And I look at the near-death experience literature. Um, and the out-of-body experience one is very much motivated by experiences that I had, particularly when I was a kid. Um, and I have to say that in reading the out-of-body experience literature and the near-death experience literature, all the claims that are made for there being evidence of veridical out-of-body perception, upon examination, I did not find convincing. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't cases in which it happens, um, but I didn't see there being evidence that was in any way persuasive for that. Um, at the same time, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's a very difficult thing to study because those kinds of experiences where people report um, uh, an, I'm not sure what to call it, an apparition of someone who then they subsequently learned died at the same time, I mean, those things occur in um, contexts that are singular, unrepeatable, that often involve um, trauma in some sense of, you know, I mean like experiencing a loved one's death is a traumatic event. So they're not the kinds of things that, it, that can be investigated in the way that science normally investigates things. So I'm open to there being what, I don't like terms like extrasensory perception or telepathy because I, I think there's a way in which they're not really coherent, like Perception depends on the senses, so extrasensory perception just doesn't make any sense. But I am open to um, the possibility of, for lack of a better word, extraordinary modes of knowing that we just don't really know how to make sense of um, and that we don't really know how to study. Um, that being said, I also think that it's really important to say that in the out-of-body experience and in the near-death experience literature, the, the, the things that people present as if they were evidence for you know, veridical um, out-of-body perception just don't stand up when you look at them closely. There's all sorts of problems with them. These, this is my view. So. Okay, a whole bunch of hands went up there. Um, let's go this way. Okay, go ahead. Thanks for your talk. Thanks. You mentioned that in your dream, everything is the content of your awareness. So it sounds like this physical waking world is primary, and in your dream, your physical body is there. And anything that you experience in the dream work, the world is somehow happening in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you ever consider what you think about ideas of the dream world as actually being a world that's not just the content of your experience, but a place where, for example, people can meet in their dreams, as some people claim to be able to do. Yeah. Um, so, shared dreams. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, when I've I've, so I've, I've, I've looked at reports of shared dreams and, you know, sites where people, you know, share shared dream experiences, and I don't find it persuasive to think that there is a dream world in which people are meeting and actually having experiences in the way that we um, think about the waking world. Um, so I would need to be convinced of that. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about that, yeah. Um, it seems to me that 
not, not to deny the experiences that people interpret that way, um, but I think it's I think there's a difference between an, a report of an experience and then the question of how exactly to interpret it, and so that interpretation of the experiences that people have, I'm skeptical of. Um, yeah. How would you interpret it? I think that um, dreams, there are all sorts of cultural practices of dream narration and um, there's all sorts of things that go into the production of a dream report that make dreams very much kind of socially constructed meaningful um, stories and so in those cases I would want to look at the actual specifics of the experiential reports, the context, the way that they're narrated um, in order to be able to say, it's not as if I could say just across the board for, for all of them, but that would be the approach that I would take, almost kind of an anthropological approach to dream reports really would be how I would think about it. Yeah. <coughs> I wanted to ask you about the inactive view of the eye as this kind of performative process, which strikes me as a compelling idea. At the same time, I haven't heard you say anything about sort of the preservation of past inactions, or if I'm a process, I'm a process that has a history, mm -hmm. and that that history is somehow enfolded into how I'm enacting right now. So I'm wondering, from your view, from that sort of process-oriented view, how do you account for that kind of preservation or inheritance or, you know, my practices now, obviously we saw with the Buddhist monks through the process of practice, they were able to do things right. that non-practitioners couldn't do. Yeah. So they are, they are this constructed process, and yet they have in, these kind of enduring capacities. So I'm wondering what you think of Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, I think, um, there's, there's individual developmental history, there's social history, there's cultural history, and those are all crucial for the enactment of a, self, of a self, especially that narrative autobiographical sense of self, which I think is, um, I think is, is very important. Um, I, I think it would be not good if we didn't have a narrative or autobiographical self. <laughs> Getting stuck on it is not so good. But not having it would not be good. Um, so what makes it um, part of what it is is exactly history, habit, skill, practice, how you're raised, the culture you inhabit. I didn't really foreground that in the talk, but I but I think that's that's central, definitely. It just yeah. seems that that so in a certain sense, I'm not an absolute self. I will change, but I also resist change. Sometimes people maybe resist change too much. So like I'm wondering if there isn't even more of a, like we can draw that kind of substance view and the process view a little bit closer together through this idea of sort of inherited practices. Well, I don't see how the inherited practices would make it substantial. I, I think um, practices and habits are really best thought of as processes and the shaping of processes. Um, it can feel from within as if there's, right. you know, a solidity to a substantial I. And that, I think, is not something that has to go along with an autobiographical sense of self. That's an add-on, or it's something that isn't essential, let's say, though it's typically there. Hi. Um, I appreciate what I hear, a, a combination of a kind of metaphysical parsimony with regard to questions of parapsychology, etc., with what I gather is um, a perspective that takes perception or consciousness as somehow primary. Um, there's a kind of primacy of perception, right, that seems to be in coming through in your perspective, which I appreciate. I wonder the extent to which that's really appreciated in cognitive science or in science in general. But that's an observation. Um, but my questions um, are, I have two. Um, one is that maybe I wasn't listening carefully enough, but it sounded like 
your, all of the various states of consciousness or awareness that you referred to had a kind of intentional structure mm -hmm. in the sense of a kind of complex of yeah. subjective and objective right. moments or poles within this horizon of awareness. And so sometimes the, the attention is fused radically with the object, but then other times a kind of sense of worlding or placing occurs. Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, it's always been intentional. And so I wonder how your research bears upon the possibility of a non-intentional mm -hmm. uh, kind of consciousness. So for example, in terms of meditation practice, I believe you were focusing especially on shamatha practice, yeah. a kind of focused right. calm abiding. But what about a kind of Vipassana style of a kind of a total relaxation of focus mm -hmm. and a kind of non-intentional mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, consciousness? So that's my first question. I, I'll ask the second one too, which is that I wonder to the, the extent to which your, your research has borne upon um, psychedelics and, and psychedelic experience. Some, some of your descriptions of hypnagogic consciousness um, seemed very psychedelic, so I just wondered if you could uh, speak yeah. to, to that as The well. psychedelic, I mean, I can answer that one quickly because I haven't really done any research on that. Okay. And, and I suppose... You might find it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 first person research, third person research. Um, I, didn't <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about hypnagogia. That's an interesting. Yeah, you can maybe. come across the bay more often. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Berkeley is so dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if, it, if people who've written on that connection. I, that, that, but that's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure whether what's going on um, kind of psychophysiologically mm -hmm. with LSD or other hallucinogens would be like hypnagogy. I don't know about that actually, but that's interesting. Um, um, yeah, and so with regard to the first question though, um, it, you're, you're right, I did, I did emphasize um, states that have some kind of intentionality or intentional structure to them. And um, certainly there are states that don't have that kind of intentional structure or there's all sorts of aspects of experience, like, for example, moods are not in any mm. straightforward way right. intentional. You know, general moods of depression or elation or anxiety don't have that kind of subject-object structure. Mm -hmm. um, there are aspects of how we passively experience the flow of time that don't have a subject-object structure. And there are various kinds of meditative states that would be um, not subject-object structured. And then in the book, I have a whole chapter on dreamless sleep where the issue is um, to think about dreamless sleep, which in the context of Indian philosophy for yoga and Vedanta and Buddhism is treated as a mode of consciousness, but not one that's structured in terms of a subject-object structure. So I talk about that in relationship to neuroscience conceptions of dreamless sleep. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and then... I'll ask you two questions. The first one, I was interested in talks like this. You get a whole lot of brain scans. Mm -hmm. What are they for pedagogically for you? Are they to demonstrate the distinctions you're drawing are real? Or do they have some other function? Because in a sense, it seems to me they don't add anything. Mm -hmm. They merely are there to sort of say, oh, this is scientific. Because that we got a brain scan. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Or do they have some other function? Because yeah. I'm always a bit wary that all the brain scans are doing is serving the evil empire of central state materialism. That you're really just filling in the gaps until eventually, oh, look, it's just the brain state. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'd be interested to understand what you're using them for yourself. I mean, I understand you may need to use them to look legitimate, but do they serve any other purpose? <laughs> That's right. right. Okay, good question. Um, so, they serve a number of different purposes. So, um, I think that neuroscience um, does provide us with important information about how consciousness is biologically realized. And I think one can say that without being a materialist reductionist, which I'm not. Um, I also think that they are useful in in the, in the particular cases that I used here, so um, two of them involved individuals practicing meditation. So, although I didn't talk about that in this talk, 
the idea there is very much what Francisco Varela called neurophenomenology, where the, where the um, idea is instead of just working in an experimental context with individuals who don't have any particular um, training of flexibility with regard to attention and awareness, working with those individuals can actually bring to light aspects of the brain's um, activity related to consciousness that would otherwise not be seen because your ordinary, again, undergraduate student participant in an experiment is not able to um, flexibly change state in a way that an individual with some kind of um, contemplative training is able to do. And individuals who can do that can bring to light aspects of brain activity that would otherwise simply be treated as noise. So you would have an impoverished picture of what's going on in the brain with regard to consciousness unless you were making use of a richer array of experiences, so lucid dreaming for example, and also individuals who can, um, who can um, flexibly um, um, stabilize their attention or open their awareness if it's a more Vipassana context, which I didn't talk about. So I see it as a, as a way of, um, of bringing out important aspects of our biology that aren't going to be seen otherwise. That said, I agree with you that... Any centrist that materialism? <laughs> no, that materialism doesn't follow from that. What follows from... I mean, what, what's important about that is, is that um, we are embodied beings. We have brains. Brains are crucial for the kinds of conscious states that we experience. And you can say all that without saying that consciousness is reducible to the brain. No, but in the sense that you could study musculature by looking at athletes. And indeed, people do that. So, you know, you develop huge athletic ability, you're going to do something amazing to your body, and it's going to show. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same way meditators spend weeks and years doing weird things to their brains, and it shows. Mm -hmm. um, does it show anything else? That's what I'm not sure what else it's showing. Well, it show so that is something interesting to show. I suppose so. That the brain is plastic, and that it is alterable through... Um, training that is mental training of attention and awareness. That, I think, is, is, is um, important and interesting in and of itself. But I think more fundamentally, it brings out the um, way that, or, or it, it has the potential to bring out ways in which our conception of consciousness and its developmental possibilities can be understood in an enriched way in light of the biology that's undergoing this transformation. So it's true that if you... Um, okay, so here's, here's what I wouldn't want to say. I wouldn't want to say that um, a picture of a, of a brain state associated with a meditative state somehow tells you what the meditative state really is. I think that's as confused as saying that a complete specification of the entire um, skeletal muscular configuration of a ballet dancer in the middle of a grand jeté tells you what a grand jeté is. This is a kind of complete confusion of levels. Um, it's also like supposing that you could understand what a Gothic cathedral is in terms of the stones that make it up. It's just that's not the right level. At the same time, though, it is important to have in view the biology that is necessary for these states of, um, of human experience without reducing one to the other. So I think you know, that doesn't come through in the, in the way that you know, I used the brain image pictures. Um, so you're, fair, you know, you're, you're right to sort of put pressure on that. But I certainly wouldn't want to present them in, in that way being taken in that way. My, my other question, I, I recently reread James and the role that language plays, particularly the metaphoric role of language yeah. in creating mm -hmm. consciousness. And I think it's extraordinarily powerful. I'm always astonished that no one talks about it. I don't know why, because it seems to me that the guy really got something about how consciousness is a linguistic construct and follows grammatical rules. And of course, it's very t uh, present in Tibetan analysis. Of course, they're very keen on this, but I think it's quite strikingly absent 
in most of the discussions I hear in this arena. And I wonder why that was, and whether you're familiar with James. Right, right. Julian James you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I mean, he had some really interesting ideas, but I think they were hampered by two things. One was a simplistic view of the brain. And well, yes, but that was, he got sunk on this very point. Right. He hadn't talked about split. Brain. Right, so that's why neuroscience <laughs> actually is important, right? Because you can get things badly wrong. And he got some things wrong there with his whole kind of um, bicameral, bicameral mind brain, business. bicameral mind business. The other thing is that he he treats consciousness as if it is all higher order thought. Mm -hmm. So that he thinks that you're basically not conscious until you have these linguistic higher order thought metacognitive capacities. And I think that that's to overlook the more fundamental sense of consciousness, which is, we could call it sentience, we could call it the, you know, the embodied feeling of being alive um, that I was talking about. You need that in order to have metacognition come into play. So he basically thinks that, you know, there was no consciousness until all of a sudden people were able to conceptualize themselves in a certain way. I disagree. And, and I just don't think that makes any but sense. No, I, he also had a weird historical story about that happening at particular times, and he yeah. moved his dates around to make it line up with his particular historical narrative. So I mean, there are lots of problems with his. No, I, I think where, where I, I think it's interesting is, as I'm talking to you now, I'm not conscious of what I'm saying, but when I think, oh, I talk to you, I remember it as I talk to you. But actually, I'm not talking to you now. That, that I think, is very interesting. And that's something that James yeah, that's, makes clear. That's con you're using the word conscious in the sense of a higher order cognitive conscious. Yes. Because you are conscious of what you're saying in another sense of consciousness that phenomenologists, for example, would call pre-reflective lived through experience. You, you, you're living through the experience of speaking to me, even if you're not thinking about it and monitoring it. And later in memory, you can kind of go back to it and think about it. So two different types of consciousness there that we don't want to conflate. The higher so, order one and the lived through one. When you talk about the one. ego or the I, mm -hmm. you want to distinguish between those two because they're very different. It seems to me that the being that's choosing the words is not the ego that I remember when I say I was talking to you. Yeah, no, it's exactly. a separate thing altogether. Right, right, exactly. Um, I and mean, they're quite different. They're distinct. Me, and I don't often see them separated. Right, they're distinct and one of the, one of the, um, what's the word? Uh, ways that we um, take the self to be real in a way that it isn't real, or take it to have a solidity that it doesn't have, is to think that the self that you, you know, as it were, pull back in memory is the same as the self that is now doing the pulling back, or that is doing something else. Exactly. They're, they're cognitively um, distinct. And that seems to me to be how you can unify the two views of you and your colleague Metzinger. In a sense, he's talking about the remembered ego that's then reified as real. Whereas you're talking about the operative ego that does the talking. Yeah, I think he wants <laughs> to say that even the operative one isn't there either. Isn't there either. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, no. Kind of dovetailing on the first question you had. Um, so I was at your talk last week at Berkeley where you were uh, talking about the, the dialogue between Buddhism and cognitive science and one of the things you said then that I really agreed with was that um, metaphysical naturalism needs to be put to the side in order for this encounter to be mm -hmm. genuine and worthwhile. Um, and I wonder if um, in terms of the inactive approach in cognitive science if you would say that it is um, incompatible with naturalism, or if so, somewhat in the way that phenomenology will do, it just brackets that uh, sort of ontological question and just looks at uh, what arises in experience and describes experience instead of looking for an explanation. Um, so, is it is an activism incompatible with naturalism? Uh, would be the first part of the question. And if it is incompatible, does an activism uh, is it sort of suggestive of uh, some kind of new ontology. Um, in other words, if an activism really does help us with the explanatory gap between the physical mm. brain and conscious experience, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of um, intimations of a new sort of ontology might an activism be suggesting? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So, um, 
if an activism is being used sort of in a first order way to refer to a particular approach within cognitive science, then I would say that um, just as is the case for any science, um, it's going to be governed mainly by um, what it's pragmatically trying to do in investigating the brain and the body and the environment and so on. And so to be a naturalist in the sense I was talking about it in the talk at Berkeley, a scientific naturalist would be to be taking a particular philosophical interpretation of what the inactive science is about that although strictly speaking not logically inconsistent with inactivism, I mean, you, I suppose you could be an inactivist and be a scientific naturalist at the same time. It would be a little bit weird. Um, because it kind of goes against the spirit of inactivism, but it's not strictly speaking inconsistent logically as far as I can see. Um, that said, if you're, if you're, so that's sort of like first order inactivism, but then if you're going to take an activism in a fuller way where you really have built into it phenomenology, because um, so let me back up a bit. People use the word inactive in different ways. Some people use it just to emphasize an approach in cognitive science that gives primacy to embodiment, to um, sensory motor basis for concepts, and so on. So that sense of inactive, you, you could be a scientific naturalist. There's no inconsistency. But in the sense of inactive, that's more full body, um, that builds phenomenology into it. So that was really the sense in which we were talking about an active saint in the embodied mind. Um, there, it, wouldn't work with scientific naturalism um, in, in the sense of, so what I meant by scientific naturalism in the Berkeley talk was a view that says that, um, has two features. One is ontological, it says everything is physical, um, and the other is methodological, and it says that science is the final authority on everything. So it's a philosophical thesis, not a scientific thesis. So an inactive approach that has phenomenology built into it would be opposed to both of those because um, phenomenology thinks that science is one way of understanding the world, but other things have their own intelligibility that science is not suited for. So we wouldn't go with the methodological aspect. And then in the case of physicalism, the phenomenological approach would be to say that um, whatever it is we mean by physical is going to ultimately take us back to some grounding in our lived experience that is not um, going to be understandable in a, in, a, in a reductive way to the physical. So that would open up into the possibility of a different kind of ontology. But it wouldn't, for me, now here there's going to be differences of opinion made, but for me it wouldn't open up to an, into a new kind of ontology, say, of a panpsychist sort. Because the panpsychist basically wants to say something like, well, um, the physical isn't sufficient as we presently understand the physical, so I'm going to put the mental into everything that there is at the ground floor level, and the mental now is not necessarily something that actually comes back to a phenomenological perspective on experience. It's a kind of metaphysical move or a metaphysical postulation. So from a phenomenological perspective, that scene is kind of speculative or, or ad hoc. The, the new ontology, maybe new is a little grandiose, but the different ontology that would be suggested by phenomenology would be something, I think, more like, um, so there's different ways to put it, maybe more like a kind of um, neutral monism where you say that um, what's fundamental is how things show up experientially and on one construal we can you know, represent that in physical, in, in, in a physical language, um, and in another way, we can we can represent it as, um, or we can conceptualize it experientially, or you might say want to say something like, um, whatever it is we mean by physical is going to have to be um, rethought in a way that it's no longer opposed to conceptually to the mental. That that all of these ontological positions move in conceptual space of physical versus mental, even panpsychism, in order to you know put the mental into the physical, it's still operating in this conceptual space of mental versus physical, and phenomenology is a way of trying to kind of think beyond that dichotomy or say those concepts aren't really going to be helpful. So that could be motivated by an inactive approach. Mm -hmm. But it's not, I would say, been worked out 
fully in inactive writings. Hmm. That was a long answer. I'm not sure that was helpful or not. But <laughs> yeah, it was helpful. I mean, so, but in terms of um, you know looking at consciousness and, and from the perspective of biological evolution, mm -hmm. say, would, would you say that? Um, maybe not consciousness, but experience, say, is, is there's, a, there's a sort of limit uh, to how far down it can reach, and that life would be that limit. And so at some point in the, in the course of evolution, mm -hmm. right around that moment of abiogenesis, right. experience became possible, and that before that was nothing. I mean, that's, that's kind of where yeah. I still see that there's an explanatory gap here. No, oh yeah, gaps. so there are explanatory gaps. So I, I've <laughs> never, I've never, I, I, I hope, claimed to close the explanatory gap. All I've, yeah. all I've ever argued is that um, the explanatory gap, as posed in the dichotomous language of the mental versus the physical, where physical means fundamentally non-mental and mental conceptually means non-physical, that that's hopeless. That that's like there's no way to bridge that gap just by construction. Whereas if we think of it, at least in relation to life, and we think of it as the living body from one perspective and the lived body from the, another perspective, that that gives us a different kind of conceptual space, a kind of body-body problem, as I put it, where we have the body that's fundamental and from one perspective it's the living body from another perspective, it's the lived body, but there still remains a gap there and a question of how exactly to negotiate that gap. Right. It's not that it's closed. Mm. So it seems like you you want to shy away from the more speculative yeah. claims. Yeah. Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I appreciate them aesthetically. I, like, right. I, I think panpsychism is neat. I, it's cool, but when it just seems to me... Panpsychism, you think, are you thinking mostly of um, someone like Galen Strassen? Yeah. Yeah, David Chalmers is kind of flirty. Yeah, I was thinking mainly of Dalen Strawson. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe Whitehead too, but uh, that's more complicated. Maybe. Yeah, it seems like there's a difference between the sort of panpsychism that Chalmers and uh, Strawson put forward, which doesn't have the same process orientation. That's certainly true. Yeah, it's more substantialist. Yeah, it's taking a substantialist understanding of mind exactly. and the physical, right. and just right. making them run in parallel. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. so I don't find that terribly appealing. Yeah. Right. You got around to reading Isabel Stenger's book? Yeah, I, I, I started it. I haven't finished it yet. Okay. Um, so um, It's not like an introduction to Whitehead. That's Whitehead. Yeah, I've read Whitehead before, but not in a long time, actually. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back and reread Whitehead, and, and, and I have to finish that long book by <laughs> <Cool. laughs> Yeah, But I sense that there's something appealing there, but I haven't worked through it really and thought about it. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Just as, as a quick follow-up, do yeah. you know of anyone who is working on an ontological grounding of phenomenology? Um, well, I mean, Merleau-Ponty did. I mean, I think, I actually think Merleau-Ponty already sort of did it in different ways at multiple stages of his writing. So in his first book, Structure of Behavior, he says, I mean, the, the, the concept he works with there that's fundamental is the concept of form and individuation. And so... He talks about the physical form um, as a certain kind of individuation in a material substrate of processes. Then he talks about the living form as um, a form that is self-organizing and regulates itself in a way that's normative in relationship to the environment. And then he talks about, he sort of jumps over the animal form, he talks about the human form as um, as social and, and symbolic. So he tries to get out of the mind-matter ontology by talking about form. Um, and then I would say in his later writing, his, his, you know, the writings at the end of his life, he tries to articulate a kind of phenomenological ontology that's hard to make sense of because it's an unfinished text to know exactly what's going on there. But you can see it as a way of trying to think beyond a perceiver, world, subject, object, conceptual structure, and one that, in some sense, you could say, re-enlivens the world beyond concepts of matter as you know received in science. So 
I don't think anybody's done any better, actually. <laughs> Not to say he, you know that that's the end of the story, but he, he, he you know, he went pretty far. Well, on behalf of everybody here, um, I want to thank you very much. Thank and, you. Um, there's a Tibetan tradition. Uh, may you, may you grace us again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, in, in some form, real self-reflective, right. modeling or otherwise. I so, you're going to say, Grace is again in your next life. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not auspicious at this point. <laughs>